panel discussion, but before I'm very delighted to actually announce our next speaker, Laura Sokotny, who is uh, essentially um, introducing this panel discussion with a very interesting title as a Pogo Robots in the Wild, um, talking about the historical perspective um, and also a future outlook. <clears throat> so the, I think this will pave the way very well for the great discussion that we have with all the speakers uh, so far from today. And we have a good wrap up of the, of the workshop afterwards. So again, it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Karov Sukatme. He's a professor of computer science and uh, has a joint appointment in uh, electrical engineering. <clears throat> and um, he's basically um, well, electrical engineering from the University of Southern California. He received his undergraduate education uh, at uh, IIT Bombay in computer science and engineering and has his uh, master and PhD degree in computer science from the University of Southern California. Uh, he's also the co-director of uh, USC in, of uh, Robotics uh, Research uh, Laboratory uh, and the director of the USC Robotics Embedded Systems Laboratory, which he founded in uh, 2000. <clears throat> his research interests are in uh, multi-robot systems and robot networks with particular focus on aquatic robots. Um, and today, again, Professor Sukatmi is going about talk uh, about uh, Pogo power on go robots in the wild. Karof, I'm very much looking forward to your talk. I'm handing over the virtual floor to you. Uh, thanks very much for joining us today um, for resource. Thanks much. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and I hope you can all hear me and see the slides. Um, so uh, uh, thanks so much for uh, uh, giving me a chance to talk. And uh, I really, really enjoyed all the talks that have come this morning. And I'm looking forward to the panel. Um, the, it's really kind of interesting to see how this topic has so many different dimensions to it. And many of the speakers who came before me highlighted some unique features that Power On and Go systems need to have. And so, as you mentioned, uh, Stefan, um, what I thought I'd do was rather than sort of give you a talk about work going on in my group, um, I figured I'd try to maybe take a step back from, uh, from the immediate work we're doing to try to reflect a little bit on whether we can really sort of try to formalize the properties of power on and go systems. Um, and since it's a workshop, I'm going to try to uh, try to do something that you can do at workshops, which is to pretend to try to formalize something while yet being completely informal about it, right? So it's a luxury you only have at workshops. So I intend using that, right? Um, and so, so what I have in mind is something like this. Um, I think before we talk about power on and go robots, uh, I think we all have a mental model of what we mean by, by such systems. But I figured it may be a useful beginning for us to ask, uh, what, what, do we, what do we generally speaking mean by power on and go systems? When, when someone says a system is power on and go, what, what do we actually mean by it, right? And in the spirit of offering a seemingly formal yet informal definition, I, I'm gonna offer this definition, right? I'm gonna say that a machine that does what it's promised on the box at the flip of a switch is a power on and go system, right? Now, there are two phrases here. Uh, what is promised is a loaded phrase. Um, and uh, the flip of a switch, of course, is a metaphorical switch. Uh, I don't really mean you have to flip one switch, maybe you flip two. But, but generally speaking, there is a sort of starting event and then the stuff that you believe is about to happen actually happens, right? And somehow we, we have this weird idea that there are some machines that satisfy this property. And judging by the talks of this morning, I think we all share a belief that robots do not satisfy this property. Um, and so the question is, can we, can we be a little bit more precise about what we mean by this? So perhaps as a useful sort of beginning as a thought experiment, maybe we just look at some common devices that are not robots, right? And so, you know, on the bottom left is this toaster. And if I ask you, is this a power on and go system or not? I, I mean, if I was doing this at a workshop and I could see all of you, I'd probably pick on somebody and ask them, but I'm just gonna answer my own rhetorical questions here. I suspect most of you would agree that this is a power on and go system. You buy it, you seldom read what's on the box because you bought a toaster before, you know what's on the box, you plug it in, there's only one power type power outlet it plugs into. You put bread in, it makes toast. Like this is generally speaking, not, not something that mystifies you when it arrives and it generally speaking doesn't misbehave when you buy it. Um, uh, the thing next to it is a refrigerator. 
it's a bigger, bulkier piece of equipment, but sort of interestingly behaves the same way, more or less. Right? You plug it in, literally, maybe you connect water in some fancy refrigerators, but other than that, the thing just works, right? Uh, if you take the two systems at the right, like you know um, your your cell phone, it's 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 also sort of power on and go. Uh, occasionally, it takes a little bit of nudging to get things exactly right. But if you don't want to really use the million features on it, it's pretty much power on and go. You flip a switch, it asks you a few questions maybe, but then beyond that, you don't have to do much. Um, and your laptop. If you're a naive user, certainly there are configurations available for a modern laptop where with very little sort of input from the user, the system is sort of ready to go out of the box, right? Um, the system in the middle, I'm just gonna, for purposes of my definition, I'm gonna argue that the bicycle is not a power on and go system. And, and the reason is trivial because um, you provide the power for it. So, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna argue that we're not interested in systems where you provide the energy to it. Um, so so I'm, this is a little bit pedantic, but I'm gonna sort of insist on systems that in some sense power themselves and you flip the switch and then they do the right thing, right? So, all right, so having said that, um, you can think of more sophisticated systems. So sort of inching towards the systems we care about in this community. If you look at like a, you know, if you look at sort of the Amazon speaker um, on the left, like an Alexa unit, uh, maybe, I mean, uh, it's uh, largely power on and go, I'd argue. Um, it, I think it does mostly what's promised on the box at the flip of a switch, maybe a little more. Um, a non-self-driving car, certainly I would argue is more or less power on and go. You, you buy it, you, as long as it's gassed up, it, it sort of presents the interface you understand and it sort of, you know, works. Um, a lot of industrial automation uh, works surprisingly well, um, assuming extreme care is taken in installation, but once that extreme care has been taken, the system just functions with, with very little with very little sort of human supervision, right? So I, I argue that these are largely pogo systems by this, by this sort of informal definition, right? Now, sort of, to state the obvious, which I think everybody here really knows, but occasionally I bring this up to non-robotics audience. If you sort of just ask this question about robots, right? Um, I, I, I pick these four robots to, to make a point, right? So if you look at the robot on the left, it's a Roomba from, from my robot. I think as far as robots go, it's one of the most successful Pogo systems ever. Um, several million have been sold. They, they out of the box, they tend to work. They don't work all the time and they don't work in every environment and they, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, but they're, they're not as ubiquitous as toasters, but they're, they're pretty good. They're pretty good at satisfying this definition, right? Um, I'm gonna argue that the Mars rovers that JPL has landed on Mars are exquisite examples of power on and go systems. Uh, they're systems that if they were not power on and go, there would be zero chance that they would get anywhere, right? They, they literally, now the, 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 the sort of flipping the on switch there is a multi-day effort. You, you don't flip one switch, you do a lot of stuff. But if you're willing to sort of give me that latitude, I'm gonna argue that that's a, actually a power on and go system. Right? Um, lots of sort of remotely piloted drones do waypoint following in power on and go mode. Um, and then sort of the early Kiva systems and the modern sort of Amazon delivery robots, warehouse robots, um, particularly for structured navigation tasks are, are operate very much in the style of this, this, this definition. Okay, so so much for sort of socializing the idea that this may be a reasonable definition. Now we'll try and actually maybe move away from it. Right? So I'm gonna offer two, two ways to characterize this a little more, a little more acutely. And both are intended to set, to set you to think a little bit about whether they are reasonable. And I, I, I hope we can talk about them in the panel a little bit. So I'm going to suggest that leaving aside everything I said right now about what's on the box and what happens when you flip the switch, I'm going to say that what I'd really like to measure are excursions beyond what's on the box, right? And so the first excursion I want to measure is, is the degree to which human intervention is needed beyond what is advertised on the box, right? 
So I'm not interested in I'm, I'm not interested in saying that a system is not power on and go just because there's a human operator. There are plenty of systems that you can classify as power on and go because they're made to be human operated, and that doesn't make them any less power on and go. What makes something less power on and go is the fact that you need more human intervention than you paid for, than you bargained for, right? And so a non-self-driving car, in my worldview, is a power on and go system. You buy it, you bought the contract that says you have to drive it. It does the rest, right? It's power on and go as far as I'm concerned. It's when it makes you do something else that you didn't bargain on that I'm interested in. Right, And I, I'm, I'm interested in pushing this point of view because I think it, it is an important vantage point on which to look at robots because robots have this entire spectrum. Some are built for a lot of human interaction, some less so, and I'll come back to human interaction at the end. So, right? so I'm interested precisely in, in how much more do you have to do than what you bargain on, right? And roboticists have a tendency to dream about D going to zero, right? They, they, there's this sort of mythical idea that uh, ultimately when, when we are really good the stuff that will come out of the box will require no more human intervention than what we already decided in our infinite wisdom as roboticists, right? So you and the customer have this common understanding of how much they will need, to, how much work they need to put into the robot, and no more will be needed, right? That's D going to zero. So that's sort of a mythology in our in our midst. Um, Dorsa alluded to a deeper mythology, which says that you advertise on the box that no human intervention is needed at all, which is which is an even more sort of deeper mythology in robotics, right? Okay. Um, the other property I, I, I want to sort of care about is this other kind of excursion. And this is, this is basically a measure of robustness, right? And this is not uncommon. Lots of roboticists look at this, obviously, just like the first one was to some extent a measure of autonomy. This is a measure of robustness. So, so these are not entirely new things. Virtually all of you study these in some fashion or the other, right? And so this, what I'm interested in here is the excursion that the robot is allowed to make beyond the operating end. Right? And I'm going to use for the operating envelope both the initial and the operating conditions, not, not just the initial conditions. Right? Uh, and so, so what excursions can the system make or what excursions can, of the environment can the system tolerate beyond what's advertised in the box where the system operation is still acceptable? Right? And there's a tendency in robotics, particularly if you're an AI person, to dream about C tending to infinity. Right? So there, there's this sort of feeling that, you know, when, 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 we, when we sort of achieve the dream, you can so sort of wildly make excursions, right? And, and many of us sort of secretly, I mean, maybe you don't confess it in public, but there's some amount of secret dreaming that goes on or not so secret dreaming that goes on that if only I could do this, right? Which also may not quite be the right way to think about it, but certainly thinking of, of reasonable excursions it may be an important property. And of course, many, many people study that under various guises of robustness, right? But again, no, I'm not interested per se in saying just because you have a big envelope, you're pogo. What I'm interested in is that if you are able to tolerate excursions beyond whatever envelope is advertised, then I, I'm, I'm sort of going to say you're pogo, right? Um, and so, so these are my two these are my two axes. So let's let's look at these things. I love two axes, right? Just for shorthand, I'm going to call them autonomy and robustness. They're sort of autonomy and robustness, right? And so, if you look at sort of the extent to which extra human intervention is needed um, on the y-axis, and you look at functionality beyond the prescribed operating envelope on the x-axis, then I'm going to argue that this little oval that I've drawn is sort of where engineered systems of the modern age tend to live. They, they tend to live in places where you need little to moderate amounts of extra human intervention. In other words, people understand what, they, what the bargain is when they buy them. Um, and they don't need to do a whole lot more babysitting beyond that. Um, but they don't tend to function hugely well outside their operating envelope. And a couple of speakers alluded to this earlier today, right? So if you make the environment very complex, well, things don't kind of, don't kind of work very well, right? Or, or if, you, if you sort of really put the system out of calibration in many ways, maybe it doesn't recover, right? So there are, but we have a fairly good comfort zone in this sort of lower left corner of, of, um, of, um, of design, of, of designing artifacts, right? Um, I mean, 
ideally, we want to create, we want to have the best of both worlds, right? We'd like to create robots that live in the, in sort of off to the lower right, right? We want to create robots that function, or many of us want to create robots that function well beyond the prescribed operating envelope with very little cost to the people around them. Somehow the, these robots are able to just deal with the fact that there's people in the environment and don't bother them more than is necessary. Um, now, um, I was sort of, I was sort of drawing this and then I, it's a natural question. I mean, we are at RSS, there's going to be lots of papers presented over the next three days. Um, it's a natural question where, where do our papers lie? I mean, uh, wait, wait, how far away are we from this sort of place we want to be? And I'm going to, I'm going to say that many of our papers tend to claim that research robots live sort of here, that they, that they, that they're, they're making progress. They're, they're not great. They're somewhere in the middle of both these two properties. So many a research paper will claim that it's sort of making decent progress towards, towards robustness while while it's sort of reasonably autonomous. And then some trade-off between the two is where we like to position things. It's rare to, rare to, um, uh, if something lives in the lower left of this picture, it's almost certainly productized. And so research papers don't tend to, generally don't tend to live there. Okay. Um, I'm gonna argue that actually most research robots actually live here, uh, notwithstanding what many of us write in our papers. I'm gonna argue that that most of our research robots, at least the ones in my lab, they, they live in the upper left of this picture. They, they don't actually live where the paper says they live, right? They require a tremendous amount of extra human intervention, but I think we, to some extent, we can be forgiven for this, right? I mean, they're research robots, I, I, they're not products. So, so, so we shouldn't be too harsh on ourselves, but, but, but we should also acknowledge that's where they live. Um, and, Let's just be really, really clear. Research robots function only within extremely narrow prescribed operating envelopes. Extremely narrow, right? I mean, you change the slightest thing and most research robots have zero chance of doing anything whatsoever, right? Even with enormous amounts of grad student help. And so that's why I'm arguing that that's where they live. Again, not a bad thing, they are research robots. But the question is, how does the journey from there to productization to that lower, to the to sort of lower right actually happen, right? Okay. Um, and so one favorite tactic is, you know, if you want to move, if you sort of want to move from over here in the upper left to sort of over here in the, in the lower right, then, you know, if you, you have to sort of figure out ways of moving down on D and moving out on C, we're pretty, we, we have some tactics of how to reduce D, right? And one very favorite tactic that roboticists have used, um, and indeed lots of systems designers have used over the decades, sort of preceding robotics, is to reduce D by modifying the environment. So one way you reduce the, the sort of the extra burden on, 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 uh, on the humans is you, you, you refactor the problem in some ways, you restructure the environment. So either you infuse some structure into the environment. So the classic example of this is for factory automation, if the vision system's not working the way it's supposed to be, don't mess with the vision system, mess with the lights, right? You can control the lights, change the lighting conditions, and maybe your, your vision system will work the way it's supposed to, right? And this is an old technique. It, it sort of is, is the common thing to do and, and very reasonable thing to do in many ways, right? Um, the, the bigger version of this is why restrict yourself to just structuring the immediate environment, build infrastructure. Right? So the, the reason cars are ubiquitous is because we chose to build roads and gas stations. Right? It was economically the right thing to do, or at least a viable thing to do. And, and so cars are successful. They're not successful because they're great at driving. They're, they're successful because they're great at driving on roads and we chose to build roads. Right? Um, and GPS is sort of the extreme example of that sort of shroud the planet you know, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a location finding cloud. Right? Just, just do it and then and then the commercial payoffs are, are enormous, even though it wasn't designed for commercial payoffs in the in sort of the early days, right? The other favorite thing we do to modify environments, um, and again, not just purely roboticists, but roboticists too, is you put restrictions on what people can do, right? And and so enforce separation in the name of safety, often very valid, also simplifies the problem for robots, right? So you can you can reduce D in a variety of ways by modifying the environment, right? And what's interesting to note is that this is not purely a technical issue. This is partly sort of human expectation management. What do you actually want from the thing that you paid money for that comes out of the box? 
right? It's part engineering, right? And it, it's largely economics. Will people pay for this thing that comes out of the box when you have restructured or refactored it to make life easier, right? And in some cases, the answer is yes, and that's where many of our engineered products live today. In some cases, the answer is no, and then those things don't get built. So a good example of, of something that never panned out um, the no example is this, right? So when cars were first invented, people were really scared that these things went super fast. Um, like they went four miles an hour on public streets and this was considered a massive hazard, right? And so one idea was the Red Flags Act that was passed in the United Kingdom and there were variants of it that were passed in the US, which basically said, look, these things are completely unsafe. In order to have them be safe, in order for any rational people to have them in society, there's gotta be a person walking in front of the car with a red flag to warn everybody that the car is coming, right? This is an example of all of the things I talked about before is putting some structure into the environment, human separation. Uh, this is a failed idea because the economics of cars dictated that this wasn't the right thing to do. The right thing to do was to do many other things for safety and, and, and have people drive around and restructure the roads and invent traffic lights and do a bunch of other things. Those are all structural improvements, just not this particular structural device, right? So sometimes getting the actual structural device right takes a little bit of time. Okay, so, so many of the things I showed you in kind of modern, in kind of the modern ellipse, right? The sort of the factory automation and home appliances and modern vehicles that live here, they didn't begin there, right? They began much like our research robots in the upper left, right? Automation was really broke down a lot. Um, early appliances broke down a lot. They required a lot of human intervention. They often required specialists to install them. They required specialists to repair them. Early vehicles were the same way. And slowly over time, we were able to move them down. My point in this picture is that we've been pretty good at moving things down in D. Um, and I suspect over time, since I said I'd say something about the future, I think we'll continue moving things down in D. We, we, we seem to understand, sort of understand how to do that. We, I mean, we don't understand perfectly, but I think we understand a lot of it, right? And so one path to Pogo robots is roughly stay within the same operating envelope. Don't tolerate too many excursions, but reduce human dependence to levels that, that are promised on the box, right? And we're pretty good at this, right? So this is the science of building autonomous systems in relatively narrow verticals. Right, and and there's a whole field of reliability engineering that does this, and lots of and you know lots of people do this, and, and it's 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 quite effective. Right? Um, so we in our lab we do a lot of this, right? I, I mean I, I I said I won't show you too much of the stuff we work in our lab, but here's one example. Right? So here's here's systems trained completely in simulation, right? And they're incredibly robust, but in a very narrow setting, right? So you can train policies in simulation. And, uh, and then you transfer them, not just to one quad order, but to many quad orders. And, uh, and you can do quite well. You can actually really develop robust control policies for machines that are quite different from each other. And yet, and yet function remarkably robustly in the real world, right? Th this kind of reliability engineering happens now, especially with modern learning tools, even in, even in kind of laboratory settings, right? Um, so, so that's not entirely surprising. What we don't know how to do is, is this other piece, right? How do, you, how do you build machines that function well beyond the prescribed operating model? And so, you know, one of the challenges I think that, that you know, the workshop organizers asked for was, was, you know, what should we do in the future? And I'm going to suggest that the, all the action really is in the second bullet here. It's, it's how do you push outward on the C axis? How do you tolerate operating envelope excursions without increasing human dependence? We're less good at this. We don't know how to do this. And I wanna argue, um, I, I, this is my lead into the panel. I'm gonna argue that most academic robotics research belongs here, right? Uh, I mean, you can disagree, but I, I think I'm, I'm betting that, that that's, that's where sort of, you know, if you had to do a new PhD or a new postdoc in something, I, I'd put my money there, right? Furthermore, I'd suggest that the kinds of excursions we are to care about are not per se low level, but they are high level excursions. So they are excursions outside the operating envelope at the task or behavior level. Not so much excursions at the trajectory level or even below trajectories. Those are important and you can't build anything without them, 
but but I think the real science is going to come if we can if we can figure out techniques that are that are sort of systemic, right? So so we can do this at task and behavior level. And several people alluded to it. Luca alluded to this in his task earlier in his talk earlier. Developing a science of system level robustness, right? These large scale excursions at the system level, at the task and behavior level, is I think where the action is going to be, right? Um, so. How do you do this? I have really only three things and I, they are things that you all have said. So I'm, I'm being the last speaker, I'm just gonna say them again. Um, the, I think the three big tools at the disposal of the community are really to, to sort of really push outward on the C axis are really to expand the operating envelope of the machine over time. And this is sort of just a very general way of saying learning, right? So all things that cause you to expand your operating envelope over time. Um, uh, intense efforts on in human modeling. So you anticipate people and you work with them in ways that, that, are, that are more expected than unexpected. And, and the last one is a little bit odd. I didn't see anybody talk about it here today, but you know, we think of general purpose robots a lot in robotics. We roboticists are sort of fascinated by general purpose robots, but we know the pra practicality of the world is a world which is largely inhabited by many special purpose machines. I think there is a lot of work to be done in task fulfillment by building device ecosystems. We generally, we generally have not spent as much effort in saying what you can do with two robots that do, do very different things, or a couple of devices that may not even be robots and a robot that together do something that, that's interesting, that's, that's sort of you know, more like what you expect from this mythical general purpose robot. And I think that's a line of research that the community has not explored as much as I would like to see it explore. So in terms of sort of tools for pushing C, I think to me, these are the three that really can make a difference. Okay, so uh, I, I, I should wrap up. So, um, so I began by saying that I, you know, in my mind, when I think of Pogo systems, I think of this, right? I think of machines that do what is promised on the box at the flip of the switch. But, but you know, I, actually I lied. Right, I, I lied. This is what I think about machines that other people build, non-roboticists. But for roboticists, unfortunately, what I think about are machines that continually do what is promised on the box and more at the flip of a switch. And that's part of the challenge. The, the challenge with robots is somehow we have invented a set of goals that even to be a pogo robot is to be more than to be a pogo refrigerator or to be a pogo toaster. And, and I, think, I think these two axes captured to some extent, many of you will, will likely think about it in other ways, but I think that's sort of the central challenge. So there's a lot to be done. Uh, it's a fun topic to think about and I'm glad there's a panel um, and uh, looking forward to sort of hearing questions and talking with you at more length on, on how to sort of fashion a science out, out of this. Um, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for, for this very insightful talk and very interesting viewpoint. It really refreshes a little bit the thinking and uh, how we look at things actually at Pogo in general. Uh, nice twist also at the end. Uh, fully agree on the viewpoint and hopefully it's a very interesting view in, in that sense to, to have a fresh mind for the panel discussion. Um, I have one question to add actually to probably to, to fuel a little bit the, the panel discussion. You When you talked about uh, Pogo, it's... Um, in your talk, at least, you focused mainly on the behavior and what the robot is doing in, in terms of tasks once you un unpack the robot and flip on the switch. Um, you weren't specifically talking about uh, like lower level elements in the sense of sensor calibration. Uh, so, for example, camera calibration, intrinsic, extrinsic, uh, I don't know, these kind of things at the sensor level. Um, my question would be, would you see that as actually meaningful to include that in a POGO element, or do you think that's a factory part and it's, um, we should more focus on these higher level elements? So I, I, think, I, think those are, I think those are important, and I suspect that you know, out-of-the-box robots need to go through a startup phase where calibration is sort of integral to good functioning, it, with what, irrespective of whatever pre-calibrated settings the system comes, comes with. Um, I think they're very much a part of, of being POGO. But to me, what's interesting, about, what's interesting about this to me is that if you, if you sort of sell me a robot and tell me that it's just going to sit there quietly when you flip the switch on and occasionally going to beep while it's calibrating. 
as long as I know that, if it takes a half hour to do that, I still consider the system a, a power on and go system, right? To me, the bigger issue is when, when that's sort of not known in advance and the systems and I sort of, you know, so for example, when I open my Mac, I have an expectation that that's not what the system is going to do, right? I mean, it's gonna ask for my name and my time zone and my preferred keyboard and da, 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 stuff like that. And I know that, right? If it sits there and says, oh, no, you're gonna calibrate my camera, all bets are off, nothing's gonna happen. I'm gonna say, yeah, d- d- what, what's going on here, right? And even worse still, if it expects my help to do so, then definitely not a pogo system. So I think calibration is perfectly, I mean, it's a- absolutely integral, but to me, it's a question of whether, you know, whether, whether it's, it's sort of in the model or not, in the model of the user or not. Um, I mean, it's not the only way of looking at it, but I've sort of convinced myself that it's a useful way of looking at it. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, that's, that's very uh, interesting and good answer, I think. And it also leads to actually a segue to uh, smaller questions from the audience. Um, I think one from, from Jonathan that really says, um, if you have this definition, you should basically then uh, lower the expectations and then you're automatically rising up in the Pogo uh, capability, yeah. right? So, yeah. right? So that's basically yeah. the, the category. Yeah, and that's, why, and that's why I said, partly this is human expectation management. A lot of yeah. successful products have become successful by lowering human expectations for them. Right, mm-hmm. uh, they, they, I, I'm not suggesting that that's what we do for robots, but it is, it is a way by which you infuse the market. You lower expectations to the point where somebody's willing to pay for it, but then they like what you sell them because it does what, you, what, it, what it said on the box, right? And so it's partly a matter of, of, of getting the system to be, to, be, to be right for a task somebody cares about, and partly as a, a, a matter of being, being able to give certificates and specifications that are actually, that are actually realistic. Uh, you can't, I mean, you obviously can't end endlessly lower the bar, nobody will, nobody will care, right? Um, I see Dorsa has a question about invention, uh, about sort of, I guess, intervention and interaction, right? Uh, uh, that's a good question. This, this business of being a little informal about, about definitions means that I, I, I just sort of let myself be, be um, I think, I think, I think to me, uh, certain devices are built for interaction. And so I, you know, um, I, I think, I think those don't make the system any less Pogo. Uh, if you build, if you build a companion robot for me, um, it's built for interaction. I don't view that interaction as intervention. I, I'm really interested in, in excursions beyond that. So beyond the sort of the interaction that, that the system is built for. So if you build a system for no interaction, I'm, I'm loath to interact with it at all. If you build a system for a lot of interaction, I, I'm loath to interact with it beyond what I, I, I bargained for. It's just sort of sort of like that is, is my model, right? So that's why I'm sort of trying to only measure excursions beyond what, what the task is. I, I mean, I know I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not being very precise about it, but, but that, that's sort of where I think the sweet spot may be. Yeah, just just to add on on that real quick. Um, yeah, so I think that's very interesting, and it goes back to you know, what you bargained for, or like what the system was promising. Like, if you build systems that are built for interaction more, is that like I'm I'm just wondering, like, is that like the way that we should go about it? So then, like, we don't call them interventions in the human. Like, it's lowering people's expectations almost, right? Like, yeah. like even even your cell phone, right? Like, it, it's personalized to you. You interact with it a lot. There are, there are a lot of elements of it that, that you have to interact with it for, for it to work. And you're happy with our cell phones. We, we do interact, we do intervene actually a lot. I don't know if it is intervening, it might not be intervened, but I'm, I'm just wondering if you should yeah. just make it. Yeah, that's a good point. That, that's a good point. And I think I saw Luca's question also, which is, you know, where, where, where do we put humans in this, in this picture I drew, right? Um, humans are interesting, right? So humans uh, pull off this trick where they come programmed so our model of them is they need a lot of interaction. And, and so, so you, you are aware that you need to spend a lot of time with an infant to, to make it function. And that's sort of quote unquote advertised on the box, if you will. And so you are willing to spend 20 hours a day doing that. You're not willing to do it as a, as a person grows older because that's not what's advertised on the box, other than special cases where it's needed and so on. And then maybe maybe more care is needed later. So somehow our ability to interact with other humans is conditioned on this understanding that that D will be high in the beginning, drops over time as the function as the person gets older, and C also 
is already high when the system begins, but unquestionably gets bigger and bigger. So you, you can't make large excursions for a small infant, but you can make larger and larger excursions for a grown up. So humans seem to not be stationary in this axis, but sort of begin on the, on the upper left and wind their way down to the lower right in, in some sense, right? So it's a wonderful example of, I guess, what learning can do. Um, so that's, that's not just learning, but, but yeah. I can follow up on that. So, uh, but again, we can be very ambitious on these uh, on these horizontal axes, right? We can ask even more from the humans. So, for example, I don't know. You can ask me um, a task which is beyond my capabilities, like piloting a um, uh, airplane, for example. Right? So, yeah. I guess at some point, even for humans, there is some level of specialization yeah. in different tasks. Yeah. And uh, I, I know that is, is a little bit less relevant for the workshop, but it seems that, you know, it takes, at some point, it takes a society anyway, like, you know, to be able yeah. to cover all these functionalities. So it goes into multi yeah. robot. Yeah. No, I completely agree. And that's why, I mean, I think, you know, C equal to infinity, C tending to infinity is just a metaphor. That doesn't really mean anything. Um, and that's why these sort of ecosystems of devices, I think, is an interesting idea. Because even for those of us who dream of general sort of general approaches or more general approaches to intelligence, we, we, we completely, humans are a great example of how at some point you build a society out of systems I and mean, you build systems of aggregates. And so it will likely be with robots as well. And I think we should be prepared for it. I guess, I guess we're humbled by the fact that even on a single robot, we don't have systems level sort of understanding of how, how, how it works, right? So, but, but, but there's a lot, but there, I think there's a lot to be done there. Yeah, so I don't see us sort of pushing out just needlessly on the C dimension um, on one machine. Perfect, thanks. Okay, folks, I don't even mean to jump in.